Hi everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar that's, uh, that we've got, we've got tonight. I'm really excited about this evening's, uh, this webinar series is brought to you in association with British Rowing's official analytics partner SAS working to help give you the power to row. Um, I'm really glad that I've got these two gentlemen um, and that we've agreed to speak to all of us about our first technical spotlight. Uh, tonight will be about the front end. Just before I introduce them fully, uh, I just want to remind everyone that tonight's webinar is being recorded and the recording of the webinar will be up on the website where you registered in a, probably in a couple of days. <clears throat> the, any questions uh, that you have as you go through the webinar, please pop them in the question box in, that you should have on your screen or on your phone. Um, I'll be looking at those as we go through the webinar and collating them and in certain points in the presentation and at the end um, I may help and, and just bring up some of those questions that I think are relevant to uh, the whole audience and ask James and those. Um, anything that I don't ask will be put in a Q&A sheet for James and Mark to fill out and then we'll put that back up on the website afterwards. Um, so Tonight we have uh, Mark Wilkinson with us, uh, who is the Director of Rowing at the Windsor Boys School. Uh, Mark uh, will be familiar, I think, to uh, many people out there uh, in the rowing world, especially in the junior world. He has worked uh, with the GB rowing team, uh, junior team, for, well, we were talking earlier, we've worked out to be about the last 14 years. Um, and the last four years, he's been working uh, very closely with Aid Roberts, the lead coach of juniors, and has been heading up the men's sculling delivery uh, through the trials and, and into the competitions. Um, also tonight, we have James Loveday, who is the newly appointed perf uh, performance development coach with the Paralympic uh, programme. So uh, yeah, James is, has changed his colours somewhat, and he's now wearing the same badge on his chest as I am, which uh, I'm... I'm very happy to see. Uh, but before that, he was the lead coach at Leander Club uh, for the juniors for four years. These two gentlemen have coached between them the winners of Henley Royal Regatta's Foley Cup uh, for, since 2017. So these guys really know their stuff about sculling. Um, and, you know, I've been privileged to have a look at what's going to be presented tonight, and you're in for a great evening. So with no further ado, I will hand over to them. Right, uh, good evening everyone. Um, thank you very much Dan for introducing us and thanks for everyone who's come in this evening to listen to some details on the sculling catch. Um, just a few logistics, um, I'm the one controlling the presentation so every now and then Mark is going to nudge me to change the slides. Um, hopefully it won't impact the presentation too much but um, just to make sure you guys all know what's going on. Um, the catch, it's a very brief moment of the rowing stroke that has a significant impact on our ability to be able to develop top end speed in all boat types. And Mark and I are going to discuss this relative to our own practice um, as if we're talking to an audience of coaches. Now, if you're not a coach, please stay and listen. Just trying to give you a little bit more context on how we plan to de deliver this webinar. Now, the plan is to discuss some general principles, then we'll start to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And overall, you should, we hope you kind of leave with a bit of a practical approach and understanding on how we can work on this technical point. We've broken down our thoughts into six sections, and they're the main principles of what we're trying to achieve when we're moving the boat, and it's just a bit of background. And then some background and fundamental skills that I think coaches need to make sure they've covered with their athletes in order to prepare them for spending time working on the front end. We'll then go to Mark, who's going to discuss some specific drills and how these could be transferred into training and racing. I'm going to go into a bit more detail about the coaching process for skill work and how we can monitor it. And finally, we're going to bring everything together with an example of Mark's Winter Boys School crew in 2018. At the end of the presentation, like Dan mentioned, there is an opportunity for us to answer some questions. So please feel free to send them through as you go along. And um, if, we get, if we can't answer it in the presentation today, we'll make sure we email you guys afterwards. Okay, Mark, over to you. Um, yeah, thanks, James. Um, hi to everyone, hope everyone's safe. 
Um, so, um, like James said, we're going to talk about this very much from a coach's point of view, and, and really this is a bit of a kind of insight into the way I think about things. We're going to start fairly simple, though, um, you know, just kind of thinking about the forces that uh, perhaps involved in, in actually moving a boat, um, getting a boat to go fast, um, or perhaps not going fast, uh, what kind of forces might might impact that. Um, fundamentally, very a pretty, you know, simple sport, and uh, you know, we all want to go fast and get from the start line to the finish line um, as quick as we can. Hopefully faster than the opposition, um, get to from A to B. I mean, you know, there ain't no bones about it. I'm, I'm in it to, to try and do well. Um, I want my crews to win. Um, but even if they don't win, actually what I want them to do is to do better each time they go out and race. And maybe, you know, that might go down to, your, you know, your like, sea crew. How are they going to get better than what they actually do? How are they going to get faster, become more competitive? Um, when we're talking about the catch, Something to remember is that basically all athletes, all crews, they slow the boat down at the catch. Um, and something that's very true about the best rowers out there is they, they tend to slow the boat down the least, but they still slow the boat down. Um, so really, um, really simple that as a kind of concept, um, but just keeping that in mind is, is quite important. Um, thinking about the, the, the catch itself, just a question out there, very open-ended question that Dan um, we'll collate some answers to and, and suggest um, them to James and I later. But uh, I think you've got a question uh, uh, box that you can put in. So the question is, when placing the blade, what kind of splash do we want? Uh, do we want middle splash, back splash, so splash that's going towards the bow, a B splash, stern, stern with splash. Just interested to know what coaches or, or athletes um, are actually thinking. Um, but moving on to the next slide, like I said, um, you know, keeping it simple is, is very important. Um, James is going to move the slide. Okay. You there, James? There we go. Um, keeping it really simple, um, we all do physics when we're at school, and, and those of you who might still be at school or were at school um, these days, but uh, not anymore, uh, thinking about equal and opposite forces is, is a very simple kind of physics concept that everyone is exposed to. And, you know, we, we think about it very much in terms of, um, you know, a lot of things that we do in, in the world, basically. So cars driving, walking, all those kind of things will come onto that in a moment. But equal and opposite forces works in rowing. That's how we move. Uh, the timing and the connection of it, very important. Um, uh, the ability of the athlete to put power down at the right time is one of the crucial things um, to actually think about. Overall, it's a really simple skill. Um, but it's a, it's very interesting how the simplicity of it is actually the is actually what makes it compl complicated and, and that's what makes it quite challenging for people to understand and master really and because it's a change in direction that's what actually complicates it more than anything um, we need to try and make it quite a natural event and if we look at um, actually some of the forces that are happening in the boat on the next slide um, if that pops up there we go there are, there are different forces that we can create. Some of them look quite similar. So bad forces, good forces, sometimes they can look very similar. And it's important that we kind of develop our ability to identify what is good and what is bad. Um, some very simple uh, bad forces I would suggest is when um, you know the body drops into the stern. Um, perhaps we get the pressure on the spoon in the wrong place. Basically anything that causes um, a, a, a force to be going towards the stern of the boat which is basically towards the start line, is obviously going to have a breaking effect. Good forces, uh, foot plate pressure, if it's connected to the water in a really horizontal direction, will create boat um, speed in the direction we want to go towards the finish line um, with. Um, like I said, on the next slide, if we, if we look at that, the, um, you know, the other things that are out there that we can think about, um, here we go. Um, cycling, running, walking, swimming starts, they, they all use the same concepts, this equal and opposite reaction. Um, so as the wheel turns around, it grips onto the road with force in, in, the, in one direction and, the, and, the, and basically the road um, repels it and pushes the, the bike along. Same when you're walking. Um, and this is quite a nice image of the swimmer turning. He's got his feet planted against the wall, fully compressed, not too dissimilar to a rowing stroke and you're going to really drive off that wall. It's like solid to actually really get hold of. Um, if you were to imagine lifting the wheel off the ground and then spinning it, um, clearly it's just going to spin around in circles. It's not going to go anywhere. The bike's not going to go anywhere because it's not actually got hold of anything. Likewise with the foot. If you imagine the swimmer 
um, actually driving their legs, but actually being in the middle of the pool somewhere, they're not going to be able to get any kind of propulsion forward. So, you know, these equal and opposite forces and actually getting hold of something are everywhere and we use them all the time. And we can really apply that um, to rowing, which we'll go through in a minute. But James is just going to go through some kind of things that we need to think about uh, before we actually get into a position where we're actually taking the catch. So, I mean, Mark's covered off that pretty well, that we want to make sure that we're pushing the boat um, in the right direction with having a positive influence it. And in my mind, that means you've got to make sure you're executing basic skills well. And um, we've taken a picture of Vicky here that she's very kindly sent over. And she sat at the front turn. And what I've done is I've just highlight, highlighted some of the well-executed basics that she's doing very well. Um, to start off with, it's something that's going on in her head, right? Uh, she's got a clear technical model in mind and something that she's working towards. She's working within a good quality range and well set at the hips, conditioned to hold that position around the hips, but also well conditioned to actually load the connection on the foot plate and link things together in order to be able to produce force. If we take that clear technical model idea, then what we need to make sure we're really trying to do is have quite a unified technical model. And it's something that in the UK we're actually really very good at. So when I began working with Mark um, on the junior sculling side of things, it became really simple to unify our ideas and therefore collaborate on things. And at any level, whether it's junior, club, senior or Olympic, um, agreeing a technical model between the coaches, the athletes and the support staff puts them all on the same page. And that unified understanding of the positions the athlete needs to be in just is what allows us to fine tune technical areas like the catch. You've got athletes that are able to understand what it should look like. Your coaches within your coaching teams remain consistent in delivering the message. And then you've got support staff dotted around. They might not be inside the building, but s &C coaches, physiotherapists that work with your athletes, just an awareness for them of how the athlete needs to be able to move can have a real positive impact on our ability to do these things at the front turn. Most of the time, we are going to have to use example videos in the kind of ideal scenario. And I think from my perspective, this is more of just a coaching point. And I like to make sure that the examples I use are really relevant to the crew that I'm showing them to. So for example, if I'm coaching a junior women's quad, I'm going to avoid showing them a video of a men's senior quad. Uh, the only relevance in that situation if you've got, is that you've got four people sculling. And the differences between those two types of boats are quite extreme. You've got rig, length, strength, and fitness. And if you wanted an elite example in that situation, then you need to make sure you show them an elite women's quad because it is relatable to them. And then after that, when you're going a little bit further on, I would actually say it's really important to make sure you're showing athletes who are actually quite close in development level to the athletes you're talking about. So if we do have a junior women's quad that's racing at club level, then maybe showing them examples of a junior women's quad that's going and winning medals of the world championships. And if you've got that crew that's winning medals of the junior world championships, then maybe you need to be showing them under 23 crews. And suddenly you create a pathway and stepping stones and how you think about doing the right things and you set this ideal picture up in your athletes' minds. Mark's showed us a few images of what the net, what a negative impact of poor body positioning can have around the front turn. I think we've had so far, we've had webinars from Rachel Hooper on assessing movement patterns. We've had one from Stephen Leonard on improving hip health and hip mobility. And what is really important and what's kind of come out of all of those is the emphasis on good body positioning. And for us, for the purpose of the catch, it's so essential to being able to accurately connect and engage the key muscles that we need to use at the catch and through the drive phase. From my perspective, I like to make sure I use stable environments like the gym to develop really core things like flexibility, condition the key movements and then strengthen those key movements. And then take a, the next sort of transition is get them on the rowing machine, apply those isolated key movements to a rowing movement. With the overall technical model in mind, an athlete should be able to start being able to use mirrors, video, to make their own adjustments to what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And then by using the gym uh, to embed 
to embed good patterns, athletes are far more likely to transfer it to your water work. I'm just going to illustrate this final image that we've got Vicky here again and talk about the importance of grip. The handle is what links our athletes to the spoon and to the water. And your hands need to be both accurate and be able to transfer a load within a fraction of a second. So for that reason, aims to teach the grip very loose and just controlled and pressed out against the thumbs. An athlete with a loose grip is able to square and feather the blade whenever they need to. On the connection, they can feel the blade load up in the fingers. That supports the timing of the drive on the foot play, which Mark's gonna go into a bit more detail about in a moment. And what that really starts to do is link the accurate catch to the powerful drive phase that we want to exert against the foot plate. So I'm gonna hand back over to Mark and he's gonna go into things in a bit more detail with regards to catch specific training. Yeah, right, so but it's really important to think about um, well, what I'm gonna go through is basically, this is how I go about it. Um, and you know, a lot of it's not very radical, uh, to be honest, it's pretty standard. And actually, if you were to read through this list, um, you know, what are we trying to do at the catch? We're clearly trying to put the blade in the water. Why? Because we want to get the athlete's physiology onto the onto the boat, basically, and move the boat. You know, what people are saying, what's the point of technique? Well, technique is about getting the engine onto the boat to move the boat um, as fast as possible. So the, the better we can do that, you know, it's, a, it's one of the few guarantees you can have. If you row better, you will go faster, basically, no matter how big or small um, or physi physiologically gifted you are or not. Um, the athlete has an, a, a kinetic chain and we want to ensure that by put, when we put the blade in the water that we're going to be able to use the big muscles first and actually move the boat and not the athlete. And I think um, this is like to really think about is that the, when, you, when you're watching rowing, it looks like the athlete's moving a lot actually. Um, but really what we're trying to do is minimise the amount that the body, the body and the athlete is actually uh, moving. A lot of my coaching is actually taking movements out of the out of the athlete and actually trying to simplify things and trying to decomplicate it and, and ensure that unnecessary movement is not interrupting what actually is quite a simple and very natural event. Um, and there's a whole sort of process that we go through towards trying to make the system very quiet um, and ultimately that will lead to minimising the boat slowing down and maximising the amount of power <coughs> that we're going to be able to put back on. Um, to get the boat moving, but it's pretty sound stuff. There's nothing in there that's kind of radical. Everyone knows this kind of stuff, but digging down into the detail of, of what we're actually trying to achieve or what I try to achieve is actually um, what I think is actually the more important um, kind of factors. It's really important to remember that the whole system is linked together, whether it's the, whether it's the hull, um, the handle, the spoon, the athlete, the wheels, footboard, the water, you know, everything is linked together. And actually to get a very consistent catch We've got to make sure that a lot of these things um, are thought about. Um, we're not going to go into all the detail of all these things, but you know, just going back to what James just said about um, preparation and setup and things you can do in the gym that's going to allow you to actually take a, a good catch. We if we just want to take a good catch, then it won't work if we don't think about how the boat's moving underneath us, the grip, the athlete itself, what's happening with the feet, what's happening with the spoon, and most definitely what's happening with the wheels and how it's all linked together. So. Looking at the next slide, um, this is where we start to really try and understand, or, you know, what's actually going on. And this is this is purely the way I try and get the athletes to think about it. Um, you know, there are other ways of looking at it for sure. I think it's very important to try and develop analogies and develop a model, and, and make sure there's buy-in with your athletes. Um, there are different ways of doing it, um, but this is the way I kind of think about it. So going back to the pictures that I was showing earlier about the cycling and walking. Um, and swimming, about getting hold of a wall, getting hold of the floor. Um, this, this is the rowing version of it. So right in the middle there, um, you can actually see the big bulge of water against the stern side of the spoon. This, is, this picture is a bit more from the finish, um, so it's really built up. But there's the wall, and you can really see that, that wall, that bulge of water against the stern side of the spoon. And that's what we've got to try and make, because it's not just there, um, and we've got to really try and push off it. And, and that's the skill basically is can we get the spoon into the water and create a wall to actually work against um, so that that power, that force that we're producing actually allows us to push off. Water is very heavy and if you get a hold of it in the right way then it can uh, work. It is harder than a, than a brick wall clearly as a liquid and there are other things that are going on. Clearly the blade's going around an arc so it's got you know, 
then movement outwards and then back in as you come through the line of work. But if you think about it from that point of view as a coach and trying to deliver it to an athlete, um, then, then hopefully it'll start to make sense. And it's important to really um, try and nail down where do you actually want pressure on the spoon and, 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 and really all the pressure has got to be on the, on the face of the, the spoon, the stern side of the spoon. Um, that's, that's the wall basically where it's attached, um, the, the big orange line in the middle, that's the blade. Um, and we want as much water against there and pressure with the spoon pushing into that water and that water really being very you know, solid against that spoon for us to work against. We don't want any pressure against the bow side of the spoon pressure against the bow side of the spoon at any time um, is going to cause a breaking effect. There is actually a term in rowing um, for that. It's called back in the boat down. Definitely don't want to do that halfway through your race. Um, pressure on the bottom of the spoon is a very minimal area. So it's not really about the pressure on the bottom of the spoon, on the, on the bottom edge. It's more that we don't want a slicing action up and down um, at the catch because that's not creating pressure onto the stern. Um, so we can we can start to really sort of start to understand um, how to actually go about achieving that and, 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 and I think like when I come to deliver it um, with athletes the way I try and get them to think about it looking at the next slide is is relative speeds basically and um, you know again going back to kind of physics is what what's actually moving and it's it's, it's kind of this Einstein theory of relativity and, and various things like that which I'm not definitely not going to go into any detail on um, people far more knowledgeable than I am but you know, is the boat going past the water? Well, clearly on a lake it is, um, but, you know, if we flip it and just imagine the boat stationary and that the water is fizzing underneath us from the bow to the stern and the boat's stationary, then I've found um, in, in kind of, you know, the way that I deliver it, that athletes can actually get hold of the concept of how you would put the blade then into the water a lot easier and, a lot, and it's just a lot clearer to them. Um, so moving on to the next slide, well, that's the point actually, just going to the bottom of that slide, there was, a, there was just before James moved on there, there was, like if you want to get really good at rowing, is find a fast moving river and practice upstream all the time. And athletes will then soon enough develop how to get hold of something. So here we go, this is, this is what I was getting to think about really, is the fast flowing water underneath them, um, and, and they got your blade, and you've got to try and think, well, how is that blade going to go into the water catch up with the water and then accelerate the water what kind of shape is it going to have to have to get in there and these are the questions so just in your question um uh, sort of panel you can just put down what you think really what's what do you think is the best way i mean i know what i think and that's what i'm going to deliver but interested to understand how other people may think about it maybe you've got a point um, that you'd like to make here but um these are the kind of options is going to go Route one, route two, route three, route four, route five. We, I tend to see all of these, and there's reasons why we might see these, um, you know, happening by accidents in some ways as, as faults. Um, but if you think about that fast flowing water, how's that spoon going to go into the, go into it? Um, so this is what I think, and this is how I deliver it. Um, this is very much about trying to think about um, coaching an athlete, and in my case, you know, I work with juniors. Uh, I coach every level of the juniors, 14, um, up to kind of the international world championship stuff. So and I've used this kind of concept all, all the time, basically, and, and literally call it clock face rowing, basically, um, and trying to get them to think about the blade hooking around a turn and to think about it going around a clock face. And I've just compressed the clock face a little bit, so it's a bit more like a, a kind of rugby ball shape. But it's literally about them trying to think about that spoon going around 12, one, two, three, four, five, six, around that circle, around that shape at the front end. Um, and, and that means that it's gonna have a very continuous movement because um, by having it as a curve, as a circle, obviously it doesn't have to change direction um, too much. So it can actually keep moving on like a, a box um, where it has to kind of change at the right angles. Um, and that allows the athletes to really get an image of going around the outside, okay, so they're trying to go around the circumference of the circle and not through the diameter. And, and clearly there's a lot of things that need to happen in the build up to this, so that, like the blade needs to be in the right time, at the right place, at the right height, etc, etc, the body needs to be in the right place, but just looking at the catch itself, the spoon, this is how I get them to think about it. The important thing to notice there is that nine o'clock and three o'clock, 
So three o'clock in terms of the blade going in the water is above the water line. It's not below the water line or level. It's actually going to have a little bit of a curve going back towards, um, you know, towards the stern of the boat um, to get hold of the pressure onto the stern of the spoon. And if you imagine that fast flowing water going past, that makes a lot of sense. If you were trying to put it um, sort of straight into the water or diagonally in towards the bow, that's going to have quite a disruptive effect on the water and definitely not allow you to get the pressure in the right place. So moving on, um, this link system is really important to kind of remember. So this is the other end. Um, this is what the hands are doing. Um, so again, thinking about clock face, um, that the hands are going to be going around the clock face, just you know, around the other side. So they're going to go from six o'clock to 12 o'clock. And again, they need to go around the circumference, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and nine and three are below um, the point where the blade's going to go in the water. So there's a little bit of movement. Um, and, and that's the shape that we're trying to we're trying to get them to take. We don't want to go through the diameter. It's going to create quite a slice or a chop. Um, it's not got any rhythm. It tends to create quite a boxy look to the catch. Um, it, struck, it means that athletes will struggle with rhythm or developing rhythm with the hands. Um, clearly, these circles are pretty small. So the way we're not really talking about finish, we talk, but so uh, that's obviously got a circle as well. We do use the same concept of finish. Um, and you can think about the finish clock face uh, being the size of a wall clock. And, and in, in this case, uh, thinking about the, uh, a wristwatch, so literally the small side of the catch, and that's what they're trying to get around. Uh, so a little circle at the front end, bigger circle at the back end. But it's that, it's that word circumference around the outside, follow the numbers, whatever you like to call it. Um, that's really important. Just remembering that what you do with your hand is multiplied down to the spoon. So that's, that's really important. And just remember, this is about coaching. This is about delivering something to an athlete that's going to be useful. Um, so moving on, um, just kind of really just kind of going back a step, really. This is, this is um, you know, something they can do on the ergo. I, I, I coach this on the ergo and I assist the boys at Winter Boys do this um, because I think, uh, you know, it's, it's time wasted if they're not practicing this kind of thing. But just looking at the images on the left hand side, you know, just going back to the whole preparation. If you want to make it easy um, to actually get around that circle to get that shape then you've got to be in a good place that is in a very consistent place and, and so this is something i look for is a really good hip hinge and a good body setup so that's going back to rachel hooper's um and uh, sort of uh, presentation and the hip health which are making sure you're in a good place and holding that place all the way forward and if you've got your hands and arms extended out in front of you you create a really nice triangle between your hands and your head and your backside and those that triangle doesn't change shape. It doesn't get bigger, it doesn't get smaller, the angles don't change on it, and they stay exactly the same. And if they can get into that position, that will always put their hands in a consistent position where they can then just follow the clock face around that little circle at the front end uh, from one, two, and three, looking at the picture on the right. Um, and, that's, and, that, and that hopefully will give them a really consistent uh, positioning. Um, there's a lot more things that go on with it um, in terms of rhythm and, and linking it to the system. So this is where, again, you've got to go back to what else is going on. So, you know, this really only works. Uh, it works. It works great in terms of, um, uh, you know, if you were to sit there and, and take a nice kind of still framed images, it looks fantastic. But obviously, um, there's a lot more going on with it. So we've got the seat and obviously there's that turns to its maximum. Um, uh, roll out towards the catch you know it's getting to a point where it's going to change direction the catch point the boat likewise is hopefully releasing and running towards uh, the finish line and that's got a, essentially a catch point um, the spoon is going to arrive at um, the point where it's going to go into the water so a catch point with the spoon and then um, the final bit is obviously the hands that's going to arrive at a catch point so we've got to We've got to make sure that we are going to get these four points um, at the same time. And then clearly, you know, you've got the athlete thrown into all this as well, and he's going to be putting power down, and that's got to be laid on at the right time. Once we get hold of it, or as we get hold of it, we can be very direct. And as the boat speed goes up, we've got to be very direct to get that pressure onto the stern side. But, you know, if we just think about the hands hooking, Yes, that's very important and we do need to train it and we can isolate it, but it is so much more. It's so important to remember that the seat arriving, the coincides of the boat arriving, coincides of the spoon arriving, coincides of the hands arriving, 
and that's the skill basically that is that's the that is the skill of um, putting the spoon into the water correctly it's far more than just the biomechanical kind of positions the actual you know the positions you might see it's got a rhythm to it it's got a flow to it it's got a, a sympathetic um, approach to the boats i.e not interrupting the flow uh, we've got to think about the blade heights because the blades can go up and down, the hands can go up and down, they can go in and out as well, they're bending their arms. The seat though, that's interesting, is because that can literally go forward and back and, and, and therefore it doesn't really do anything else. The thing about the seat, because it only goes in and out, is it will always stop. No matter how quickly, even if it's a nanosecond, it will always stop. But as it stops to change direction, those hands mustn't stop with it. And that's the thing I see a lot is that as the wheels stop, the hands stop. And actually as the wheels stop, the hands have got to keep moving um, to allow that connection to happen at the right time. Um, so yeah, so, move, so moving on, um, you know, hopefully that kind of makes sense. We're kind of moving through it fairly quickly, but um, you know, making sure there's a rhythm to it um, and that you're allowing the boat to release and that you're sympathetic is really important. Things that, um, kind of get in the way of that are generally to do with um, uh, you know preparation and not setting up correctly um, not getting the blade square properly uh, having the blade too low um, and so this this is a shape that I see a lot uh, both of these and there's a couple of others as well and that's where the blade is quite low to the water and has to really go up into the air or, or, or has to go up into the air to square up correctly Generally, as athletes do that, it goes too much, um, and, and we get this kind of up and then slicing back down effect. And you can see that it looks nothing close to going around that clock face. It tends to slice into the water. We don't get any pressure onto the stern side of the spoon. Uh, we get I, I call it a stalling handle. Um, it's basically a stall through the dry phase. It's, it tends to coincide a little bit like with the stuff on the right hand side. Um, it's basically athletes who really chop and slice into the water putting way too much power into the footboard um, before they've actually um, you know got close to putting spoon in correctly and getting that pressure set um, and, and basically what happens is the blade clearly because it hasn't got a hole or anything moves very quickly which means the handles moving very quickly which means the seats moving quickly and the athletes probably moving in the boat and it will hit the water and everything will stop or slow down and then it'll bob around a bit and then it'll go again. Uh, so rather than having a very continuous acceleration and application from the footboard through the athlete down to the spoon, we get something that's a bit more stop start. And both of these, um, you know, in my opinion, are, are caused by poor preparation, but also probably poor understanding from the athlete about what they're actually trying to do. So these are things to really look out for. And, 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 and both of those, and particularly the, the image on the left, you know that literally work tirelessly to get rid of that in athletes all athletes get that that's at some point um and it's it's really not doing them service in terms of um what they're capable of doing they could they sort that out they would go a lot quicker without having to do any more training um just by getting hold of more and having more time under the water to actually push the boat past that connected point so there's quite a few faults and reasons at the bottom there i'm not going to go through them but um you know, I think there's quite a lot in what we've just been through there. Um, you know, the, in summary, it's really like how do we get a rhythm um, to the to the blade going into the water? How do we get it onto the front of the spoon uh, to actually push off? How do we get hold and make that make that water water and get hold and keep hold of it right the way through? Um, and so, you know, go, now we've got to sort of really look at the realities of, of actually getting that into the athletes and drills um, and using them to actually encourage athletes to learn a form of massive parts of my program. And, and even when I take crews to the World Championships, um, you know, we're doing drills a lot, trying to develop and a real understanding of what they're actually trying to do. Yes, there's a lot of training as well, but we always take the time to do these exercises. There are lots of drills out there, um, and there's certainly a lot of ways of adapting them. And you can definitely be creative, but if, if someone said to me, you've got to pick, you know, three or four, maybe five exercises to do, um, these are what I would do, um, and and they're all connected together. They all link up together, um, and, and and so they're interrelated. They're not sort of random picks. Um, for me, like no doubt, perhaps the hand hooks you might not have seen before, but everything else you you will have seen before. There's nothing new to it. Um, for me, it's all about how well you can teach them, um, the athletes, to do these drills, 
and then being absolutely uncompromising with their ability to learn them and develop them and then use them in their rowing. It's not a magic wand. Uh, it's definitely not a one hit wonder. You can't just do them once and, and forget about them. You've got to do them regularly all the time. Um, so these exercises, got a little video, which hopefully is going to work. Um, uh, I might be able to talk over the top of them, but there's a few notes to them. So James is going to push play. Uh, hopefully it works. Um, hopefully you found that interesting. I'm very happy to take questions on that at the end, um, for sure. James is going to talk a little bit about coaching in, into the program. So I'll hand back over to James. Right, um, so, so far we've had an opportunity to go through some principles, uh, the kind of prerequisites we need to be able to have in place in order to be able to actually just get into position and do things around the front turn. And now Mark's done a really kind of detailed overview of the specific ways of doing things and how we can work drills, et cetera, into it. And now I'm just going to go for an overview of how you can actually start programming this in and making sure you treat a technical focus the same way you would treat any other improvement that you're looking to see in a rowing program. Um, this is actually a segment of a training program that I ran at a junior camp uh, last year uh, with, the, with the boys at the Ander. And it was around April. And you can see straight away that on the right hand side, we just had a few overall objectives, which really included everything we wanted to achieve from the camp. It was brief, but it's just focused on the things we wanted to achieve. And we included within that a focus on the accuracy of connection, timing the last turn of the wheels with a well connected blade. And that ties really very well into the principles that Mark's been talking about in this linked system. 
it is a junior program um, so we really only get one camp a year and this was our main opportunity to focus on something so you can see early on in the week we actually had some testing that we needed to do it wasn't ideal um, but what it did put in place for us was later on that week we could actually really relax a little bit and we could spend time just focusing on the technical focus and really just saw it as an opportunity and this technical focus ended up being something that we spent the rest of the season working on but this at, on camp was where we embedded the drills that we did and we really really honed in on improving things so within this we have six athletes only moving through a quad throughout the week the technical sessions do vary there you can see there are points where i've said that um do stuff heavily coached and there's other stuff where i've put in where it's just much more uh, athlete delivered and both are important um, athlete delivery it's really important to understand how your athletes are interpreting the changes especially with a fine movement and you're using lots of different analogies that mark referred to early on so it's really quite important to make sure you understand how they're delivering it within the boat and then if you look further down the line we've got some bursts and we've got some rate changes we've got some 2k pieces and all of this stuff was an opportunity to change the speed of the quad and really try and build things up and we used video at these moments to record things you can see on that top one friday the fifth uh, video front turn feedback we went through that video around lunchtime that gave them an opportunity to go out to do some more bursts and did a really big technical focus on that saturday as well and that really is quite a good opportunity to just make sure that you're really i guess knuckling down on the drills and you're creating some good athlete understanding on what they're trying to achieve from them and you see at the bottom of those um, coaching notes the final session of the week was a 2k and we were lucky enough that bristol university's first day was out there so we did some pieces with them and what i think is really important when you're programming these types of things in is make sure you take the opportunity to put the athletes under pressure and see what happens and that's all it's about it's just seeing what happens when they're under pressure and they're in racing they're in a side-by-side -side race does do things stick and i'll give you a clue in april they don't uh, but hopefully at some point down the line, you're actually going to be able to get them to stick a little bit better. So if we take this and we say, right, okay, well, what are we going to be, how are we going to be running each individual session? Um, anybody who's done a coaching qualification will know the session structures and plans do exist for a reason. Um, first of all, let's just make sure that I like to make sure I'm briefing the session uh, well. I take an opportunity, get everyone, make sure they're all in the gym. Uh, and in that briefing, you clarify the purpose of the session what are the drills that we're going to run through in the warm-up what's the main session going to be and overall it's really what the expectation is from them as a minimum standard personally i expect athletes to just do what they're capable of doing as a bare minimum and ideally i want them to be pushing those boundaries in order to improve and um, anyone who has been coached by me will know that i will stop them if i see them just going through the motions and that's something that i'm really quite diligent about Mark and I agree pretty much we're on the same page with the warm up is quite a key opportunity to work on something technical. And it's for a few just practical reasons. Um, got the full attention of the athletes. It's very close to the briefing. Uh, you can keep feeding back the things that you see. You can use the analogies that we've been talking about in terms of the clock phase, to support the message. The warm up doesn't have to be exhaustive. You don't have to do 10K of technical work. It just has to be disciplined from the athletes with just plenty of coaching feedback along the way. Main session, make sure the crews take ownership of it. Hey, this is an op this approach will be filled with errors earlier on in the season. Okay, they will make mistakes. It won't get the message across as well as you want it, but it will improve with guidance once you start to hear what they're saying and what they're doing. And that's really ideal when you come to your main event and you're pushing them off. You know they're going to deliver a high quality warm up and you know they're going to deliver a high quality race because you've been providing that opportunity throughout the season. And then finally, at the end of the session, um, I just make sure that we recap some of the key drills just for a couple of minutes. Um, it's, again, it's not meant to be exhaustive. And at the end, we do this when they're queuing up to come into the landing stage. And it just sets the debrief up well. The athletes that do well are the ones that spend time doing it and just checking in and making sure that the way they started the session is the way they finished it up. And then use the debrief. And that's probably the third chunk where I do a decent chunk of just reiterating the key points that have come out of the session. I think it's just the aim of providing good quality feedback and that can be verbal or even later down the line in terms of video, which leads us uh, quite nicely into how we use the boats. 
practically it is important to move, move between the boat types um, the single is something that we push pretty hard uh, you get an opportunity to learn as an individual they get to try new skills and they're going to be willing to make mistakes and um, I'm sure the athlete in this picture won't mind me saying that he achieved a huge amount last year uh, but he also probably fell in one of the most because he kept on pushing the boundaries of what he was capable of doing and as a result he improved and he got a, the quality of his rowing just increased as he went through the year and he ended up going to the junior world championships at the end of the year when you're paddling and racing it is our slowest boat which means the athlete can feel greater load on the connection so when they are trying to work on like engaging with that wall of water that mark's been talking about uh, they can learn to leave the handle still they've got a loose grip they can time the connection with the foot plate they can link that into good drive acceleration spend time organizing the recovery without the speed necessarily getting away from them in the same way as it would in a quad or having to follow someone else so it just isolates the athlete a little bit more they're the only one who's doing stuff in the boat so they're in complete control of what they're doing i really like the use of doubles um for drills and it's for a simple reason that you can get an individual doing a drill and a double with someone holding it level. You've got an athlete in the boat that can feel what's going on, that's holding it stable and able to provide feedback. And you can just change things. You can actually make some quite big changes. So especially when I'm teaching skills very early on, um, the doubles are a really good one to use. And paddling and racing is a little bit of a different kettle of fish. You've got two people rowing together. There's a significant increase in boat speed, which means that feeling of load that I was talking about in the single is probably a little bit less. And it just means athletes have to be a little bit more dynamic and they start, you just start to increase the speed and the quality of those hand movements and therefore the blade movement going into the front turn. And then finally, when we're jumping into a quad, there's a few good opportunities here in a quad. First things first, you've got the opportunity to execute all these drills you've been working on as individuals in units of two or three with someone still holding the boat level. Um, I think if we if we take Mark's point that the point of the drill is to isolate a skill that we eventually want to transfer to paddling and racing, the ability for multiple athletes to do drills in units adds another layer to their skill development. As a crew, the boat speed has increased again. The quad is probably the most punishing boat if the athletes connect poorly. So we just make sure that we're inter integrating development athletes into quads so they get the opportunity to see and feel what it's like when the boat really gets quite fast. And that really ties into all of the fundamental skills and just reiterates the importance of doing these things down the line. When we're doing it from a practical level, this is an example of a training program, again, from last year, it was between September and November. Um, it was starting off getting some singles work done, used it for individual assessment, making sure that we just had basic skills. And I would say about five of the eight sessions that we were running during the week would be incorporated into this. We we'll then use doubles for that new skill development, use the quads for pulling into units, then use a single for kind of refining that individual learning together. That double, again, just going to get it, get it working together as a unit, put the skill in practice under pressure and at speed in the single, use pieces, et cetera. You can see at the end, we've got three quad pictures there and that was moving into the fours head. So we kind of jumped into the quad for about 10 days and we just went through this pattern of get the skills done at speed, put bursts in, change things refine them and then get it out racing and expose it to the conditions and see what happens so when we take when we're coaching something we need to just make sure that we are monitoring improvements as we go through it really ties into this idea of a technical program um, this training plan session plan movement between boats hopefully illustrates the importance of just planning the front turn into an overall program personally i've spent about 13 years coaching and every day I spent developing my coach's eye and um, it's not something that's quick it's taking time um, but finally, it was starting to get to a point where I get to, I can see things and I can see how they work out. But we do have te technology around us that we can use. Um, most good phones now have a camera. And most of them have most of them you can access visual coaching apps, and there are free versions of those. So some of you can film crews doing drills, paddling, pieces, and racing. You can do it from varied viewpoints, side on from the front, the launch, the bike, overhead from a bridge, and all of them provide a viewpoint that is integral to monitoring the progress around the front turn. Some of the athletes, uh, I would make sure you just show athletes the video and make sure you get their opinion. And this just ties into making sure they're feeding into things and they get a really good understanding of what's going on. And you'll find that delivers in the boat. Uh, finally, as a coach, you just got to make sure that you um, really take time to step back. I've been in the middle of the action of summer season, but I've made it a real 
opportunity to use key events to uh, go back to finding fine tuning skills. So if you're doing something like the school's head, you've exposed them to racing, you've seen what happens, and then you can use that training camp period leading into something like the national schools to make adjustments. There are obviously more expensive ways to monitor technical changes. Uh, these include telemetry technologies. Uh, telemetry doesn't always have to be extortionate. You can get apps on your phone that show acceleration curves. Uh, those are really useful pieces of information to see the timing of the connection and see how the boat's moving as a result. Um, expensive systems do provide an array of objective information. But what I would say on that on that matter is that if you take, for example, Mark, like the first time he ever used Celebrity was last year. And last year, um, I would say the squad I was working with had a very successful season and it was the least that I used the Telemetry on the boat. And it's really great for providing objective information, but that information should be used to support what you can see as a coach, not necessarily do the job for you. I'm going to hand over to Mark now to wrap it all up and he's going to give us an example of Windsor Boys in 2018. Right, sorry about that. I'm, I, was, I was on mute, so I'll start again on that. Thanks to James for that. Basically, what I was saying was um, uh, using telemetry was very interesting last year. My conclusion from it was that it was showing me exactly what I was seeing anyway, which uh, which was good in some ways and also quite interesting. Um, here's a question for you. It's a bit open ended. Um, so what is the most important thing about a drill, um, do you think? Um, so something to just pop into the question uh, box. Dan could pick up, um, but this this is uh, kind of leads into Windsor Boys, and um, you know the timeline at the bottom there could be days, weeks, months, um, and in fact this is actually years. Um, the thing about drills um, is you've got to teach them in isolation, um, and that's really important. The athletes has got to understand uh, the reason, the rationale uh, for what they're you know actually doing. It, it, like if you just do it for the sake of doing it, which I see quite a lot. There really is not a lot of point. If you only do it once and, and never do it again, not a lot of point. Um, and then you've got to take it through and you've got to test it. You've got to take it to low end stuff. You've got to take it to rate changes, burst, step pieces, go and race a little bit. And then you've got to review it. You've got to keep going backwards. At some point, though, you've got to go and take it to your main target event, which might be two, three years away. And good programs will run over those kind of periods. And then, of course, it's all about just doing whatever it takes to get the result that you are after. But you know, hopefully, if you've done it properly, then everything will kind of stand up to what you what you want it to stand up to on, under pressure and for them to go out and perform. And the, the, the crew, moving on to the next slide, it's a bit of a montage of photos, but, you know, the, the, the Windsor Boys um, effort in 2018, that crew, you know, there's a lot of people involved. There's a whole squad around it. We had multiple variations. And, and it really was a culmination of, of years of development. I mean, you know, going back to that timeline on the previous slide, you know, we, we made the final at Hendley in 2014 and lost. Um, we lost again in 2016 in the final. And each of those times we were kind of learning along the way. And actually my conclusion after 2014 especially was that we were just not skillful enough at the front end to actually really go and step up to the next level. And so we worked on it. Um, in 2016 we got better but lost again. And then 2017 we were good and we won. And then 2018 um you know it's it's been sort of regarded as, as quite an exceptional crew which you know from my point of view is obviously quite rewarding but there was a lot of things going on around it it wasn't just one thing there's the gym there's other athletes the ergos water other races singles doubles everything um, and these guys who ended up in the crew moving on to the next slide when they started they were just they were just typical year nine year 10 j14 15s they had poor posture poor blade control all over the place chop the chop the catch and we had to teach them and we just basically teach 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 learn 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 practice 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 and that was quite a key term actually what's the difference what, you know how do you practice how do you train how do you link the two together and you've got to try and separate the two out to begin with um, and eventually moving on to the next slide they ended up um, really quite good um, they weren't perfect and you could definitely pull out mistakes for sure i've highlighted the stroke man it actually turned out to be the bowman uh, when we came to actually uh, deliver the, the final pieces uh, at Henley. But he, um, you know, he still had a little bit of a chop and, and didn't 
took him a little while and you'll see that in the video in a second that he, he kind of gets away from the catch really quite quickly and doesn't quite get connected but body posture and preparation were a big part of it um, um, and you know eventually it was all about you know how do we get in a position where we can take that front end get the pressure on the spoon maximize the length under the water and the physiology that we have they were good athletes um, but they you know they weren't exceptional in terms of ergos you know the guy sitting in the stroke seat who ended up in the bow seat his best effort in the ergo is only 637 um, and obviously Bryn um, you know two silver medals of the world championship is quite good but his best effort was 616 on the ergo so very good but not not ridiculous it wasn't the six minute pace um, and likewise the other two um, so yeah they did pretty well but there's a little video um, but my big big uh, best advice is really um, to just be very consistent and uncompromising with um, you know your delivery of stuff Okay, uh, brilliant. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, yeah, I guess we'll start handing over to Dan and see what the questions we've got that have come in are. Hi there. Uh, uh, first, guys, uh, thank you ever so much. It's been a, a really interesting uh, presentation. Um, I have uh, two questions, one which I hope you can answer in, in very, very quickly. Uh, and then another one which which maybe might take a, a minute or so as I know we're running out of time so the number one one uh, the first one would be uh, how important is it to match the skull and grip diameter to the athlete's hand uh, very important they've got no chance of gripping it correctly particularly if they're young and they've got small hands don't give them a large blade give them a good you know get, cut it down or get a decent sized blade um, handle or grip or set of blades that they can actually use otherwise you've got no chance yeah okay uh lovely and then and then the other one is uh one of your videos uh you showed the hand hook exercise uh with bent arms yeah. and uh we were just asked there's a few people that asked about a lot of them the people have coached it with straight arms but just yeah. interested to see your reasoning behind the bent arm um for that exercise 
yeah, so um, I'm a big believer in doing it with straight arms as well, um, but I think that's actually probably the next step. Um, the, the bent arm one is, is, is an isolation drill. So literally that is just trying to train the hands and get them to really think about the profile of the hands um, at the front end and just to sit still. Everything else is passive, try to be anyway. It's much better done if it's done individually in a crew boat or in pairs if it's in a quad. Um, and all they're trying to do is just think about how their hand is actually going to go around. I, I don't advocate trying to row with bent arms, but it's more um, just really nailing down and isolating and thinking about that clock face, think about where the pressure is going to go. Um, and that just gives them an idea. And then it kind of develops into that hook and nudge. Um, and, you know, that's kind of then using the glutes. But it's when that happens, it's important that they still think about that hand profile. You can, you can exaggerate it as well. I mean, if you really want to train your hands to go in the right shape off the back end, or a quarter slide, push your hands down into the bottom of the boat, square the blade up, and then the only direction that the hands can then go is up and around at the front end. Otherwise, you'll end up with no, no knuckles as you hit, hit the rigger in front of you. Brilliant, brilliant. Guys, um, we, we've just gone over eight o'clock. Um, as I just want to remind everyone that, that any of the questions that we haven't answered, and there's been a few, uh, I will uh, put those to Mark and James. Um, later and, and they will fill out a, a Q&A sheet which will go on the web page that you signed up to on um, uh, to register for this webinar that will also include uh, the slides from this presentation and also the video of the webinar so you can you can play it back um, thank you James uh, thanks Mark just uh, next week everyone we have uh, a clean sport uh, qualification um, which is free if anyone wants to join in next Tuesday um, that will be your clean sport one uh, for the year and then on Thursday there is a webinar about club hub and how that can uh, help your club uh, so there may be people that you know that might not have tuned into our British rowing webinar series as of yet but that might be relevant for them so please do pass that on um, thank you very much again and good night Yes.